Well, today on this Trinity Sunday, we will be coming to the Lord's table to share Holy Communion. And today's sermon is titled, Holy Communion, Fast or Feast? What do you think it is? Fast or Feast? We do come into the presence of Almighty Holy God. And I want to ask you to consider how can we partake of New Covenant Holy Communion with the Living God? It's Trinity Sunday, so remember the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You really ought to ask yourself this all the time. Every day you live, and certainly every Lord's Day, how can I worship the Father in spirit and in truth? This is what Jesus says in John chapter 4. He tells the Samaritan woman that the Father is seeking those who will worship him in spirit and in truth. Uh, how can I, how can you, please the Lord on the Lord's day? It's a different kind of approach now. A lot of times we want to think in our flesh about what pleases me. I liked that song. I didn't like that song. I liked that sermon. I didn't like that sermon. I liked that part. Of what if worship were about focusing on God and pleasing God instead of pleasing me? What a concept, right? So how can I please the Lord on the Lord's day? And you know what we say according to the Westminster Catechism, right? What's our main purpose and ultimate goal? What's our chief end? It is to do what? To glorify God and what? Enjoy him. Enjoy him forever. So I hope you're already getting the hints now. You probably don't want to go with the fast thing on the Holy Communion. You probably want to lean towards the feast. Um, enjoy him forever. Holy Communion, fast or feast? Well, we've been preaching through Luke's Gospel, and we continue uh, turning today to Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. And I invite you to hear now God's Word. Jesus is going to help us learn how to approach Holy Communion and what Holy Communion is all about. Uh, Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Now, it happened on a Sabbath, he, Jesus, was going through grain fields, and his disciples were plucking and eating some heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands. But some of the Pharisees said, why are you, that's second person plural, why are y'all, why are you doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbaths? And Jesus answering them said, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him how he entered the house of God and took and ate the bread of the presence, that which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those with him. And he said to them, The Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So back to our question, as we prepare today, this ought to cause you to really pay attention. You, you are going to receive from the table of the Savior of the world, the one under whom all authority has been given, the holy, living Son of God in communion with God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Are you focused on how you could possibly ever take communion with him? How can I please the Lord on the Lord's day? Well, fortunately, Jesus has just given us the answer. It's going to be, some of this is already drilled into our vacation Bible school, hence some of my answer here, uh, kind of bringing these things together, communion, vacation, Bible school, and our answer. So how can I please the Lord on the Lord's day every single Sunday, not just coming to the table today? How should you come to worship? How should you and I enter each day? First of all, by faith, by faith, I need to do something. And what is the answer? See that poster? 
Following Jesus changes everything. So go ahead and fill in the blank. Follow Jesus. The disciples were following Jesus as he cut through the grain fields. By faith, follow Jesus and by faith, fellowship with his disciples. Yes, this happens to be, I don't always do this, as you know, but you're going to get three words that begin with F here, okay? So you got follow, okay? You got fellowship with his disciples, those who are assembled as his church in worship. It's not a lone ranger operation thing going on here. Follow Jesus, fellowship with those who are with him, engaged in his mission. In other words, his church engaged in his mission. And then, freed by God's grace, feast. Follow, fellowship, feast in his presence, joyfully and fully. The Sabbath was, is, and will forever be Holy Communion. So let's go back to the um, creation order. The creation order, Genesis chapters 1 and 2. Let me remind you of the creation order. It's framed with day 1, day 4, and day 7 involving light and God bringing light and presence and communion. Okay, that's the way it's framed. But let's go towards the end of the story. Day six. Okay, we've got work, we've got creation going on in six days, okay? Day six, how does it begin? Does it begin with the creation of the human beings? No, it begins with the creation of the animals of the earth the living souls of the earth, animals. Only later in day six, in other words, at the tail end of all the creative work of God, at the tail end, this is not literal now, but just kind of roughly speaking, metaphorically speaking, on the afternoon of day six, day six and a half, okay? God creates the human beings Male and female in God's image. Everybody with me on this? Everybody remembers this, right? What does God do next? After the creation of the human beings toward the end of day six, does God then round up the human beings and say, all right, finally you're here. Now get to work. The garden needs to be cleaned up. I've got things for you to do for the next month. You better be glad I created you. You're going to work like dogs out there. Is that what God does? No. Day six closes. Human beings created in God's image. And what comes next? A holiday. Day seven. Are you getting the sequence here? Human beings are created and immediately brought into the holy day or holiday of feast communion with God. Look, this this garden's full of all these trees, all this food. Eat to your heart's content. In the cool of the day, I'm going to commune with you. It's all about fellowship. It's all about celebration. It's all about holiday. That's built into the creation order. Genesis 1 moving into Genesis 2. That's the way we are made. That's the way creation works. I know the way human beings do religion is counter to this. I, I get that. I've never heard this before, you might say. Or most of the churches or most of the religions I go to don't talk about that. I get it. But this is the way God does it. So in other words, who is the Lord of the Sabbath? Who's the Lord of the Sabbath? God is. And what does God do? God creates and gives, gives. Day seven, Sabbath as the climax of the creation order. The entire creation order is moving toward Sabbath and Holy Communion with God. Do you hear me? (laughs) The, The climax of the whole story moves towards day seven and Holy Day, Holy Communion with God. 
That's what the Bible is telling you from the opening page. That's what it's about. That's what God is about. That's what God is calling us into. So who's the Lord of the Sabbath? God is the Lord of the Sabbath. I, I want you to, to, to get that right because we're going to come back to this. God is the Lord of the Sabbath. And as the Lord of the Sabbath, God is a God of what? What do we talk about all the time in a Reformed Christian church like First Presbyterian? God is a God of, it was part of Dean's title to his sermon last week, grace. Now, I really want to invite you to understand this. The Sabbath, day seven, is about God's grace for us. The whole creation is about God's grace for us. In Christian churches and in the Protestant church, we tend to think sometimes a little one-dimensionally about grace. And for good reason. We talk about how we have sinned, which is true. We're sinners. We're dead in sin. And we need Jesus to save us, correct? So a lot of times, we begin and actually end the conversation about grace with that story of God's redeeming mercy for us. But I want you to hear this. God is a God of grace apart from us and not contingent upon our sin. Do you understand what I'm saying? God didn't come up with grace only because we sinned and based on a synergy with our sin. Before all creation, from eternity, God is a God of grace. Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is a story of grace prior to sin. The Sabbath is a gift of grace prior to sin. And all of the Bible is moving us toward a restoration under God's redeeming grace so that we can prepare to celebrate the eternal feast and celebration of the Lord so that we may enter God's rest the grace of God far above and beyond, eternally beyond our sin and any need for redemption. When God creates us, when God gives the holiday, the holy day, immediately after creating us, that's about grace. Perfect grace apart from and eternally before our sin. Got it? So, as the Lord of the Sabbath, God is the Lord of grace. He included his rest as the climax of the creation order, and he made us for this, which means his rest and the Sabbath are not a straitjacket or foul-tasting medicine that we need to do to make sure we're okay with God and then go off and live our lives. I know people think about that in their flesh. That's the way they think about church. That's, way, that's the way they might even think about communion. That's not what communion is about. That's not what a life with God is about. It's not like, well, take your cod liver oil, honey. It's good for you. I know we have to kind of grit our teeth and bear it out, but it's on the other side of it. It's going to be okay because we'll be out of all that church stuff. No, no, no. <laughs> the fellowship with God is the point. It is the grace. It is the holiday. It is the feast. It's the festival. Sabbath is not a straitjacket. Sabbath is the supreme gift of the creation order and ultimately the, the, the point of the great celebration of the heavenly feast, the wedding feast of the Lamb in heaven. So, even after the fall of humanity and even under the Old Testament law with all of its prohibitions, I grant you all of its prohibitions about the Sabbath, what is the Sabbath called? Come on, Levitical scholars, come on, come on with me now. Leviticus, chapter 23, come on, come on. Mayo, it's the first and foundational feast of the feast. Leviticus 23, right? The Sabbath is the feast of the Lord that we are to celebrate every seven days all the way up to the ultimate. And what's the ultimate, by the way, celebration of Israel? The seventh, seventh year, the Jubilee year, which Jesus proclaims he's come to announce. I'm here to announce the favorable year of the Lord. Remember what he preaches in Nazareth? I'm here to announce the seventh, seventh year. In other words, the ultimate Sabbath celebration that has no end. That's what Jesus is saying in Nazareth. Sabbath all the way through. 
Supreme gift, Holy Communion time. Even after the fall, even under the prophetic law, Sabbath is the foundational feast. And then also, of course, Pesach, Passover, weeks, booths, they're all feasts. For, catch this now, for sacred assembly. You don't go off and do your own thing. We come together as the people of God to be with God and with each other in grand celebration. Even under the Old Testament law, Leviticus 23, the Sabbath is a, what? Fill in the blank, a feast belonging to the Lord, of the Lord. So now, back to Luke chapter 6, verses 1 through 5 in context. Let me run through this pretty briefly. Remember, we've got a chiasm here, three agenitos on one side, three agenitos on the other side, three episodes on one side, three episodes on the other side, and the one we spent in the middle, uh, two, two Sundays on, the last couple Sundays on, the central episode. So let me run through these, just remind you. Luke 5, 1 through 11, agenito, it came about, it happened. A miraculous catch of fish, Simon, the first disciple, who confesses himself a sinner before Jesus, remember the very first one, and who confesses for the first time Jesus as Lord of any of the disciples, and Jesus then commissions and calls Simon to catch alive men for him. That's 5, 1 through 11. 5, 12 through 16, another agenito. I mean, Luke is really framing this out for us if you actually read the Greek. A leper prays to Jesus, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Jesus says, I am willing. Jesus, the Holy One, touches the unclean leper, cleanses him, and declares him clean. 5, 17 through 26, another agenito, and this time a conflict with the Pharisees and the scribes, the teachers of the law. Jesus declares his authority. First time he's used this term. It's his favorite term for himself as the Son of Man, as the Son of Man, to forgive sins. So that's the kind of the, the third of the three on the one side of this. And he forgives and heals the paralytic. Then the middle segment, uh, not again to this time, Kai Metatalta, after these things, it's the middle thing. Jesus calls Levi, the toll collector, and fellowships, communes with toll collectors and sinners. And he declares that he's come to heal the sick and not to call the so-called righteous people, but sinners to repentance. Jesus then goes on and declares himself the bridegroom. In the Old Testament, the bridegroom is God. So who did Jesus just say he is? He's already been forgiving sins and only God can do that. Now he's the bridegroom too. And he says, while the bridegroom is with the wedding party, they have to feast, they cannot fast. Are, are you catching this? When he's with them, okay? Um, he declares that he's come to throw out the old clothes, the old religion, okay, the old Judaism, um, and, and the old wine. It's not going to mix. You can't mix the two. You can't kind of fuse the two together. You have to have totally new clothes, Jesus' new robe of righteousness, and you have to have totally new wine. Now, on the other side, here we are. We just arrived here today. The other three agenitos on the other side of that central uh, passage. Uh, agenito, again, a conflict. Jesus declares himself, declares himself as the son of man to be Lord of the Sabbath. Next passage, next week, 6, 6 through 11, another agenito by Luke, another conflict. And Jesus not only now declares himself Lord of the Sabbath, he demonstrates and defines the Sabbath. He demonstrates he's the Lord of the Sabbath and defines it. We'll get to that next Sunday. And then finally, on the third of the three on this side, the final agenito, and Jesus names the 12 apostles. In other words, he's telling you, I have authority to reestablish a new Israel. That's the reason there's 12 apostles now. He, he's, he's saying all this. All of this is flowing together. It's all fitting back and forth together. So what is the Sabbath, a fast or a feast? Conservative rabbis built traditions and rules as a precautionary, this is not my term, this is their term, it's in Mishnah, a fence around the law. In other words, God helped us out with the law but we need more details so that we don't get close to violating the law. So let's add fences. Okay, this is Mishnah here. I could pull out the Talmud, but you've got a lot of volumes of Talmud. I'll just commend the Mishnah to you if you want a little bit of night reading tonight before you fast go to sleep. Okay, uh, including how many among the fence, 
How many classes of work prohibited? How many? Well, the way they put it is this. Um, the main classes of work are 40 save one, sowing, plowing, reaping, etc. So in other words, there are 39, you can fill in the blank, 39 categories of work that you cannot do because you need that fence around the Sabbath. It's a Mishnah Shavuot, number seven. Luke 6, one through five. Notice this now, in those days, they're not roads on the side of fields. The roads and the paths cut through the fields. Okay, so Jesus is cutting through grain fields. His disciples are with him. They're picking pieces of grain. It's spring season. In other words, it's right after Passover. They catch that significance, by the way. This is just a little light note there. It, it's springtime. It's probably the second Sunday after Passover. Okay, And, and the, it's springtime, so there's harvest. Their early harvest, they're, they're plucking grain, they're, they're rubbing it, and according to the rabbis and the conservative religious people, that's, that's violation. If you're plucking, you're harvesting. If you're plucking a few pieces of grain, and if you're rubbing them, that's milling, okay? That's, that's another violation of Sabbath. And by the way, if you're preparing them to then take them to your, your mouth to eat, you've just violated the service laws for serving meals. I mean, they, these guys right and left, they're violating. Now, would, uh, don't you just love the Pharisees tracking these people down as the police out in the grain fields and raising these objections? You think they're maybe violating the Sabbath at the same time? What do you think? Well, anyway, so they're out there. They're, they're protesting. Supposedly, these disciples of Jesus who are following Jesus are working. The Pharisees' real questions to Jesus are these. How do you justify this? And here's the ultimate question. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? Jesus answers. Now notice, Jesus does not get down into the weeds in disputing the Mishnaic elaborations of the law. He doesn't even fool with that this time. He's going high level. I mean, really high level with his response. First of all, he talks about David. You can read about this in 1 Samuel chapter 21. David, young David's on the run from Saul. David needs food for himself and for the little group of lads, inferring, kind of reading between the lines. Apparently, there's only four with him at this point. When he comes to Nob, where the, um, uh, the tent of feasting, of meeting is, the Ohel, uh, Moed, uh, there. And he, he needs food. And he asks Ahimelech, who's the high priest, for food. He says, do you have like maybe like five loaves? And Ahimelech says, the only thing I got is the, the sacred bread, you know, that's for the priest, like before in the holy place, that's put on the golden table, the 12 loaves. That's all I've got. Um, so notice the way Jesus puts this. David, and who ate the bread? Those who were with him. Catch that. That's the way Jesus puts it. The bread of the presence in God's house. David and those with him ate the bread of the presence in God's house. Jesus says, that which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat. Now notice he has them dead to right because there is nothing in the Mishnah, nothing in the Talmud, nothing in Jewish tradition that critiques or indicts David for doing this. Why? It seems to be a clear violation of multiple laws. Because David is the Mashiach, he is the anointed of God. When he's running from Saul, he's already been anointed by Samuel. He is the chosen one of God. No, we are not going to delete half of the Psalms out of the Psalter. We're not going to cut David out of the Bible. No, we're not going to get after David. And they know that. So this is just as high level as when Jesus in the last days in the Holy Week is disputing the teachers of the law in the temple courts area. This is the same kind of stuff. Jesus is totally eviscerating these guys. They have nothing to say. They have nothing to say about David because they know they've never critiqued it. They've never attacked it. There's nothing in their traditions that attack this thing about the Mashiach, the anointed of God, David, doing this thing. Jesus answers by saying, my disciples effectively are with me the same way David's boys, Na'ar, were with him. And by being with me, I sanctify them. If you think David sanctifies them, I'm the ultimate Messiah. I sanctify anybody who's with me, anybody I choose to sanctify. That's basically what Jesus is saying. So Jesus is the what? He is the fill in the blank, the king, the Messiah, the anointed one. 
even the greater than David. He's the greater than David. David is just a prophetic type that points to the ultimate Messiah, the son of David who will establish a house of God forever. So Jesus has authority to declare those who are with him, following him in mission, fit for Holy Communion. In other words, if you're actually with Jesus, he can justify you and sanctify you and declare you ready to receive from this table. That's what he just said. That's who he is. But, but there's more. There's, there's actually more. Jesus is also the what? We've already introduced this. He is the bridegroom. He's the bridegroom. God in the Old Testament is the bridegroom. Jesus says, I'm the bridegroom, and my people party with me. It's a feast. Go back to Luke 5, 34. Can you make the wedding guest fast while the bridegroom is with them? This is the same language now back here. Jesus is saying the people with David were justified to take the bread of the presence. The bread of the presence. Now, let me just, the bread of the presence, it literally means lechem pani. It means the bread before the face of God. And there are 12 loaves representing what? 12? Israel. In the holy place, under the mayor, the lamp. Okay, you, you, you're catching this, right? The lamp and before the face of God. That's the bread that is given to David. So how much more does Jesus have authority to bring us to the very face of God and feed us as the new Israel. That's, this is part of the, I mean, this is deep stuff. This is, Jesus is amazing, right? So anyway, and then Jesus answers this, the son of man is what of the Sabbath? The Lord of the Sabbath. Jesus says, okay, remember Genesis 1, Genesis 2, who's the Lord of the Sabbath? God. Jesus is here saying, I am, in case you missed the bridegroom thing, I am God. He's the Lord of the Sabbath. And Jesus says the Sabbath is not a fast, it's a gracious feast. So New Covenant communion is definitely not about a fast, but about feasting. When we come to his table, and when we receive from his table in a few minutes, I want you to know this, he's already paid for it all. He's purchased it all, and he's inviting you to living communion with him the one who can totally justify you and sanctify you as you come to him. He's purchased, a, he purchased it all. Paul gets this, for instance, dealing with a different issue, sexual immorality, but in 1 Corinthians 5, 7 and 8, he says, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. So let us therefore celebrate the feast not with old leaven, not with old bread, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. So how can I truly worship God? How can I come and receive fully and properly communion today? Remember our answers? By faith, follow Jesus. By faith, fellowship with his disciples who are assembled as his church engaged in mission. And freed by God's grace, feast joyfully. Enjoy it. Enjoy God forever in his presence, fully. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I invite you to pray these, these words now. By your spirit, Heavenly Father, give me true faith in Jesus to follow him and to fellowship with his church, those who are with him in his mission. Please free me by your grace so that I may joyfully and fully celebrate Christ's feast in his presence and in your presence. May your face indeed turn to me and shine upon me and bless me and bless us together. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. 
If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.